continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Our investigation today is of the American chief executive, from its beacon of democratic ideals to the imperial presidency, to what appears increasingly an authoritarian mindset, if not regime, in the White House today. We explore this with the country's leading presidential scholar, George Edwards III, university professor and chair of presidential studies at Texas A&M home to the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library, author of the Princeton University Press volume, Predicting the Presidency, Edwards is editor of Presidential Studies Quarterly and the Oxford Handbook of American Politics. His extensive scholarship from Washington to Trump studies all aspects of the presidency, in particular leadership, legislative success or lack thereof, and the constitutional systems governing our Commander-in-Chief. We're going to root our examination in historical context today. And first, I must ask George if there is precedent for the American presidency to veer into autocratic waters as much as it has today. Well, that's certainly uh, an interesting way to start the, our conversation. And certainly there have been claims over time that the president is an autocrat or is about to become an autocrat. Even George Washington was criticized by the Jeffersonians as actually wanting to be a king. And uh, we don't think about that in a, when we think about our founding fathers, but that's exactly how it was. Andrew Jackson was often called King Jackson. Uh, and Abraham Lincoln, the claims were that he was acting in an autocratic fashion, suspending the writ of habeas corpus and ignoring court responses to that. Uh, he made a counterclaim that, well, he was trying to save the Union. And that, was, that was okay. Certainly Franklin Roosevelt, when he was very successful in Congress, we think of the Hundred Days, for example, or the Second New Deal beginning in 1935, and it was claimed that he too was an autocrat. So it is often the case that when presidents are successful, when they're really operating, and when they in the rare instances where they get to dominate the political landscape, the claim is made that they are an autocrat. Uh, in the current politics, we have a president who began his tenure with some very high visibility, highly salient orders rather than legislative proposals. And I think that has once again raised the issue of the autocratic nature of the American presidency. Which contradicts the very essence of the conservative promise, ruling by executive fiat. Yes, the notion, well, the notion of our, of our entire system is that it's decentralized power and there'll be many players, many interests, and they'll all be represented at the table, and that we'll have a balanced government. And that's certainly what the founders wanted was balance. They really talked about balance quite a lot. And ultimately, every presidency ends up being more balanced than autocratic because of the, the sharing of powers in our, in our constitutional system. And since you share powers, that means that there, that, that there are checks, there are balances that every school child learns. And they really do play a very prominent role in the nature of American government. So it's federalism for the win or the rescue. But if you think about those two last instances you mentioned of Roosevelt and Lincoln, there was a driving impetus behind the assertion of power 
the authoritarian model was compelled, as you mentioned, to save the union, later on to save the economy. In this instance, there isn't a commanding policy vision. In fact, it is conditions of incoherence and pandemonium where government by dysfunction or disarray or chaos. That, that wasn't yeah. Roosevelt and that wasn't Lincoln, was it? In, in the, no. mani the managerial the imperative to create chaos. Both Roosevelt and Lincoln faced existential crises. And Roosevelt faced it twice uh, because later it was World War II. Uh, right now, uh, we don't have an existential crisis. However, uh, Donald Trump ran for office uh, telling Americans that they needed to fear. And they needed to fear international trade, they needed to fear immigration, for example. And so his action regarding what is commonly called a travel ban, or, or at least a temporary travel ban while increased vetting of uh, refugees, uh, is based on a notion that there actually is a crisis. Now that's an empirical question whether you have a crisis and not everyone would agree that we have a crisis. But if you think that um, terrorists are pouring into our nation and therefore we have to act immediately and take draconian steps, uh, then that is the same kind of argument that, that, that others have used. We have a crisis and thus I must act in this fashion. As I say, it's an empirical question of whether or not we have a crisis, and we've often made the mistake of, of crisis. For example, uh, all leaders come to office with a worldview of the way the world works and why it works that way. So we can just go back a little bit in history, and we don't have to go back very far, and we can see in Iraq, after 9-11, uh, American leaders were very risk averse and that's perfectly understandable and they looked at Iraq and they said Iraq represents an existential crisis. Now that's really an empirical question and they said they concluded that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and that they threatened the United States. Well that's a pretty serious matter if that's the case. Now it turns out it wasn't the case they didn't have weapons of mass destruction and they were not a threat to the United States. But when people have that in their head and when they don't vet this thoroughly, when they don't challenge the premises of policies, then you often have policy disaster. Or if you imagine those crises that don't exist and then prescribe solutions in your mind that are the antithesis to solving them, in fact, there's blowback well, that, that's absolutely right. And that's one, one of the many reasons that leaders, presidents, need to have a good handle on the nature of policy. They can't just rely on advisors. It's not enough to say, well, I'm a great chief executive. So all I have to do is sit here, and then my advisors will give me the options and the information I need, and then I'll make a decision. And this notion that all we have to do is get the right person at the helm of the ship of state and everything will go smoothly because they'll be advised and they're wise and they'll make good decisions is illusory. That's not the way the world actually works. Historically rooted, what do you observe as the most unprecedented of the unprecedented features of this president and administration? The lack of elected office or government service was the most obvious during the campaign as was the refusal to release tax returns, as is increasingly a mental state which is in question. So when you add those combined, yeah. how do you measure it from any historical orientation? Well, the president certainly started from a, a weak basis, which is not a criticism of the president. He got as many votes as he could, but he got nearly three million votes, fewer, fewer votes than Hillary Clinton. So that undermines any claim to a mandate, and it's certainly when you get 46 percent of the vote, it, it's not uh, a showing of an outpouring of support from the American people. So that's just a, a weak position from which to begin your, your tenure in office. There certainly has been a lack of transparency in, uh, in, in his business dealings and, and other matters uh, regarding his health, 
regarding his taxes, regarding his conflicts of interest. And so that, 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 has, been, that has been an important, but it's really, in a way, a sideshow to the operation of the presidency itself. I think it's also interesting that this, this president has chosen people uh, more to the extremes on, a, on an ideological spectrum. We would certainly expect a Republican president to get conservative Republicans, naturally, in, 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 as advisors, as appointees. And uh, that's the, the president has certainly done that. But he's also chosen people with somewhat idiosyncratic views. Uh, Mr. Bannon is an example of that. And he, is, he has chosen people who, by and large, don't have governing experience. And he himself doesn't have governing experience. And I, I think we see some of the, some of the uh, outcome of this in, in the early days of, of the Trump presidency when we have hastily written um, executive orders or when we have policy made somewhat apparently off the cuff and with it, without proper vetting. And usually policy doesn't, doesn't have to be made in, in one or two days. You can, you can indeed vet things properly. The president seems to be uh, insensitive to that. One can hope that he will, he will learn from, from his early, uh, early experiences and, and be, be more systematic and more thorough in the future. Um, but that's, that's a speculation at this point. One of the most stunning things to me, and I wrote about this in a Time Magazine essay, was the absence of any references to Trump's forefathers in the RNC acceptance speech. When he accepted the Republican nomination for president, there was no ode to any past president, living or symbolic. Mm -hmm. To me, that was a daunting notion of a lack of inspiration from our very creed, our very fiber as Americans. Well, that, is, that has been noted, and, and you're, you're absolutely right. I, th I think, I can only speculate here, but I think that the president sees himself as not, uh, not in, in terms of continuity, but in terms of an intervention, an intervention that's different, that's going to take America in a different direction. Does that have precedence? Uh, well, certainly it, it is, is not unusual for presidents to think that they're doing something fundamentally different. One can only go back as far as Ronald Reagan. And, and he says, look, I'm, I'm really quite different. I, I'm really a different kind of president, and I expect to make major changes in public policy. Uh, John F. Kennedy came in and said, I'm going to make major changes in public policy, and the torch has passed a new generation, and we've got new things to do. So, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt, he didn't campaign as, as a radical, if you will. He campaigned rather as more of a conservative. Uh, but when he got into office, certainly and immediately started making major changes in public policy. He, but could you trace, Congress, could you trace back... Reagan, Roosevelt, Kennedy, can you trace back their DNA to the origin of presidential well, yes. being in a way they, that they, you can't they, for they, 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 were, they were likely to strike the chord that I'm, I'm, I'm continuing in a great tradition and that I'm really fulfilling fundamental values mm -hmm. of Americans. And, that's, and I, I'm, just, I'm just the latest iteration of this. And we may have slipped a bit in the, in the previous administration, but, but we're going to get back on beam here. And um, that's, that, 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 is, that is very common to invoke the past and to invoke great leaders of the past and great values and ideas of the past in the American creed. Uh, I, I'm not sure that Donald Trump really is, is overly sensitive to American history. And I don't think he thinks in those terms. I mean, at least that's my observation. I don't know him personally. I want to make, make that clear. Uh, and, and I don't think that he thinks, uh, he, he thinks in, in certain terms clearly. He thinks a lot in terms of protecting people, and protecting them from, from competition, protecting them from terrorists, uh, example, uh, for example. And he, he, he sees America's, Americans at the moment as victims and that they're victims of, of countries that don't pay enough into NATO. They're victims of a country that, 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 that has un, unfair trade with us or that, that um, send people across, across our borders or, or that terrorize us or, or whatever. And, and therefore, he needs to protect, to protect Americans. That is not typically, typically the tack that uh, an American president takes. We're recording now in 
who knows what has transpired right. in the intervening okay. days and weeks. But this question of accountability, checks and balances that you alluded to from the outset, you have studied formulaically and anecdotally the evolution of the presidency, the limits of the bully pulpit, the, the evolution of the bully pulpit, and how do you see this in all of its eventualities ultimately unfolding? Right. Well, Donald Trump is a good, good example to, uh, to use for, for this question. It's quite natural for a new president basking in the glow of an electoral victory and having just spent two years probably talking to party leaders and party activists in the American public and won the biggest prize in American politics by doing so, to think that they must be a really persuasive fellow. It's, it's quite natural for that. And it's quite natural for them to look out on the political landscape and say, you know, there's a lot of impediments to change. You know, we have a lot of gridlock, stalemate, characterizes American politics. A lot of people complain about that. You know, nothing's getting done. And I've just claimed that I can get something done. I've just been making promises that I can get something done. And so the force of my personality is such and my persuasiveness, I'm going to create opportunities for change. I'm going to change that political landscape and pave the way for change. Uh, and it's quite appealing for us as observers to think about history in terms of great presidents and to explain the big changes that did, did take place, such as the New Deal, for example, or the Reagan Revolution, if you like, uh, in terms of a really persuasive, great president who, who, who uh, had unusual skills and a great leadership style. But the fact is that that's all wrong. And, and it's the context that really matters, the opportunity structure. The circumstances. Yeah, yeah, that, that a president faces. One part of the opportunity is, you know, what's happening in the economy at the time, et cetera. Another part of the opportunity is the hand that the voters have dealt the president in the last election. Did they give him a mandate? Did they give him majorities in both houses of Congress? That sort of thing. But when it comes just focusing for the moment on, on the relations with the public, and presidents, modern presidents, all spend a lot of time dealing with the public. And certainly Donald Trump tweets the public quite frequently uh, <clears throat> as president. So he's trying to communicate with, with the public. And then, of course, they, they use the press. The fact is that, that presidents almost never move the public in their direction. They virtually always fail. And that's the case of Franklin Roosevelt. That's the case of Ronald Reagan. That's the case of Bill Clinton. Take any great politician in the modern times where we have data, and the same thing has happened. And so one would have to predict uh, for Donald Trump that he won't be able to do that either. He started with a weak base, which is, again, as I say, not a criticism. It's just where he started without a mandate. The general tenure of, and, and he, didn't, he didn't specify a lot in his campaign about policy. It was a broader, aspirational type of campaign. Which they, led people to hope that he could yes. channel the pragmatism of American Ex politics exactly. rather exactly. than appeal to the extremes. Right. Make America great again is a pretty broad right. focus. Okay. So and hence hence winning over Bernie Sanders supporters in Wisconsin, yeah, Pennsylvania. Exactly, exactly. So then, then we face as a problem. All right, I didn't start strong, but can I get some get more people? Are people at least generally open to what I want to do? And it's a mixed bag there. You know, people like tax cuts, people like their borders being protected, but but they don't they don't necessarily like uh, abuses uh, of, of refugees, etc. The country is highly polarized. Public opinion is highly highly polarized, and that's the, the question. There is. Are there people in the middle that you can get and bring to your side? You can just convince them with your, your good arguments that you're going to be making to the public, your tweets or whatever. You know, can you bring them to your side? Well, when the public's highly polarized, you can't because they're way over here. They're not in the middle. They're way over here. And finally, you've got a fundamental problem that you need to understand that very few presidents actually understand at the beginning of their tenure. They understand at the end of their tenure, but not at the beginning of their tenure. So they make big mistakes. And that is, is public opinion very malleable? And the answer is that it's not very malleable. As it, as it turns out, uh, it's hard to get the public's attention and maintain it. 
you speak a lot through the press. There's a lot of distrust of the press. There's a lot of distrust of the White House because of polarization. People have predispositions about public policy, strong predispositions, and it's very hard to change those predispositions. And the public is misinformed frequently, not just uninformed, but misinformed. And ironically, the more misinformed they are, the harder it is to overcome, to correct that, that misinformation, the stronger they feel the, in, in those views. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to persuade people to change their minds. And presidents almost always fail to do so. And, and they, 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 they begin thinking they can. Think of Barack Obama at the beginning of his tenure, who can give a very good speech, can be very eloquent, thought that he could just take his case to the public. He was very open about it. His advisors were very open about it. And they will rally to my side. How do you see the possibility of a contemporary presidency that is not plagued by the kind of ideological tension that we have talked about today? <clears throat> There's not good prospects in the short term for that. When you start out with a, a, a highly polarized public, which we have, it's, just the, it's the most fundamental fact of life in American politics is the public is highly polarized. So they, they look at the same information, they look at the same world and see different things. And um, so Democrats are upset at Russia. Republicans are now thinking more positively about Russia because the leader they already support, Donald Trump, is thinking more positively about Russia. So they're looking at the same world with, with, with different colored glasses. And as a function of pa being power hungry or wanting to stabilize their power. Both, both sides want, want to take power. And they have, they have funda fundamental, fundamental differences. And when it looks like, by the way, that both each side can actually get power, and think of how often the Senate has changed hands o over the last, last 20 years, uh, which is not historically common. Uh, that means that you have a real incentive to oppose, to not make the other party look good. So that's an overlay as well. And so you want, you, you, you want power, you don't want to cooperate, you want the other party to look bad. So whatever they do, it's got to be bad. So you, so. Uh, Republicans oppose Barack Obama from day one. And I think that, it, it's, it's frankly, I think it's, it's nonsense. That, well, we would, have, we would have negotiated with him, you know, if he'd just been willing to negotiate with us. I think that's largely nonsense. Tell me the alternatives they offered for Obamacare. I mean, just tell me what, what, what was it that they, were, that they were willing to do. He did, you know, on, on the uh, fiscal stimulus, he went half virtually halfway with them, meaning making it almost half of it tax cuts. I mean, there's just two big early policies that set the tone for the Obama administration. Democrats are not likely to think highly of, of much of what Donald Trump will, will, will have to offer, I'm sure, as soon as it gets offered. Uh, and we're still, we're, we're still waiting on that. Uh, so if you've got, if you've got this, this, this polarization, <coughs> And you don't have some consensual issues which are dominant. I mean, and by an example that World War II was a consensual issue which dominated everything. Now, God help us, we don't want something like that. We, right, and we, we don't, don't want yeah, it to yeah. be created for right. the purpose of right. coalescing power. Right. We talked at the beginning about president's own perception or the public's perception of the president as king, but when the public sees the king has no clothes uh, or no grounding in democratic values, the case in point I was surprised you did not mention was Watergate because of the parallels now and the ongoing investigation. When does the public wake up to a president, President King with no clothes? Well, it, it can take a while, particularly because of polarization. So, it's, so right now, uh, Donald Trump's supporters are still his supporters. His base seems pretty solid to me. And he's got more people disapprove of him than approve of him. 
but his base doesn't seem to be weakening. And he's going to have some campaign rallies for the next campaign, four years from now, apparently. Uh, and um, it's going to take quite a while. Now, what actually turns people's attention ultimately is day after day in the news, things they can understand, which looks like failure. So ultimately, ultimately, uh, the American public came to see Richard Nixon as, as having violated the law and therefore probably need to be, needed to be impeached. But still, still, about half his party stuck with him, even at the very Through an end. election. Through an election. Well, through an election. As the investigation But even, even, in, even at the end, think about this, that at the end, towards August of 1974, when he resigns, and he's down in the 20s and, and, and approval. But that had to come from somewhere. Now, if you look at what percentage of his party was supporting him, we're talking about roughly half his party was still with him. Democrats, virtually everyone was against him. Uh, independents against him. But a lot of his party stuck with him to the bitter end, even after all of the months and months and months of highly visible testimony carried live on TV very prominently. Uh, they still stuck with him. So I think that President Trump's supporters are going to stick with him. And, and you know, we're nowhere near Watergate here. I, I don't want to imply that what Pres President Trump is in danger of being impeached. I know that that is certainly something that, that Democrats have been talking about since day one, that there would be an impeachment ultimately, but we have a long way to go right. before that happens. Well, it's far-fetched when we think about fireside chats devolving into emojis uh, as the Twitter president, but <laughs> hopefully we can retain a degree of rigor in our public affairs, and we thank you, George, for helping us do that today. It's been my pleasure. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.